so I'm, I'm 26 years young. I'm from the UK and uh, I'm, I'm the owner of Affluent Co, which is a multi-service digital marketing agency. And we launched around three years ago now. So very much, we were young in our infancy, turned over our first million dollars in our second year. And it wasn't a very, it wasn't a very straight path to success for, uh, for myself. I, I went to university and studied architecture because my dad always told me, hey, look, architects earn a lot of money. And at the time, arch uh, at the time I was financially motivated. I'm not afraid to say that. I'm certainly not now, but I was initially. And so sure. I thought, right, if I work in architecture, I've got a keen eye for design, then one day I'll be able to be paid loads and loads of money and I'll be able to design houses, which would be quite cool as well. You need to lay with to start with the foundations. You need to understand your buyer persona, your, your customer avatar. Who is it you're actually trying to sell to? And the easiest way we can do that is just looking at our existing customers. And I think one of the biggest mistakes people make when they first start any kind of digital advertising is they try and sell all of their products or all of their services straight away. And it, it gets really, really messy and really confusing. Whereas we always teach people to start with the lowest hanging fruit. So sell your best selling, your number one statistically best selling product or service to your number one best audience. And so if that means you're excluding 50% of your customers, so be it. You want to focus sure. on the ones or, or the majority. And once you then get return on investment, you're gonna get confidence in your ability to advertise, and then you'll be able to replicate whatever strategy you used previously on other products or services and other demographics and audiences. Hi guys, my name is Avi Arya, father of two girls, six dogs, husband to a superwoman, a streetcar racer turned hotelier, now social media marketer and founder of Internet Moguls. So that <laughs> is my long and short hero story. And now I'm gonna uh, leave it to you, Jordan, to tell us your story. <laughs> nice, nice story, man. What a, what, what a come up. That's amazing. So yeah, but firstly, thank you so much for having me here. Um, well, how far, how far do you want me to go back? So I'm, I'm 26 years young. I'm from the UK and uh, I am, I'm the owner of Affluent Co, which is a multi-service digital marketing agency. And we launched around three years ago now. So very much, we were young in our infancy, turned over our first million dollars in our second year. And it wasn't a very, it wasn't a very straight path to success for uh, for myself I, I went to university and studied architecture because my dad always told me hey look architects earn a lot of money and at the time arch uh, at the time i was financially motivated i'm not afraid to say that i'm certainly not now but i was initially and so sure. i thought right if i work in architecture i've got a keen eye for design then one day i'll be able to be paid loads and loads of money and i'll be able to design houses which would be quite cool as well thing is when i got to university i found out my lecturer said to me, Jordan, look, if you're in architecture for the money, that's no longer the industry you want to be in. You have to train for six <laughs> years and you'll be lucky to get a £25,000 a year salary after those six years. I thought to myself, that, that doesn't sound like something I really want to do right now. And so I actually lost love with the subject a bit. And I launched a company alongside being at university. I started running nightclub events. So I would host these elaborate events in, in three different nightclubs in my local city. And the, the nightclub would actually take all of the revenue from the bar. I would take all of the revenue from the door because we built a bit of a network in the local area. Now, the thing is, that made me stay up very late and stop attending university in the mornings and my lectures. And I actually managed to get myself removed from my university course, which was... A very low point for me, but I don't know what I was expecting to happen at the time. I of certainly course. wasn't expecting that to happen, but I should have been. <laughs> sure. And and so at this time, I kind of had this elevated sense of self-importance. I was living this lifestyle. I had a bit of an image because of the nightclub industry. It's a bit of a toxic industry. And I started getting myself into a lot of debt to try and keep up or maintain the image that I had around university right. and around the city. And I managed to get myself in thousands and thousands of pounds worth of payday loan and credit card debt. And I hit this point where the nightclub industry business started failing and I hit rock bottom and knew I needed to get myself out of it. And so I started looking on paper at what jobs I could get to earn as much as I could in the short term. And so I moved into corporate sales. So I had a telesales job. I was absolutely terrified. I used to run to the corner of the room and, and shake and quiver with my script in hand. And I just forced myself out of this position and actually managed to find out I was pretty good at selling. It just so happened to, to be. And so I worked my, myself through a number of different sales jobs, but I never really had that 
the ultimate fulfillment from it. I, I had a bit of money, which I was motivated by, but I didn't actually have time to enjoy that. And so I started going back to the drawing board, went back to the business drawing board and looked at business models that were trending at the time. And, and three years ago, and even so right now, social media marketing, digital marketing yeah. is just a booming industry. Businesses now more than ever realize they need to be advertising. And so I decided to launch a social media marketing agency specializing in Facebook ads to which we may manage to scale up pretty quickly using the experience I had in sales, although that certainly wasn't a, a, a straight ride. Um, and then we that recognized is. that there are a lot of other people of our age and a similar age demographic that wanted to launch into marketing agencies as well, wanted to be successful, but didn't have necessarily a direction that was going to, or a vehicle to get them there. And so I started a YouTube channel and I started documenting my business journey, documenting the agency growth. We've scaled that to around 140,000 subscribers now in about a year and a half. Oh, after congratulations. That channel. I see the silver plate at the back. Yeah, there she is. <laughs> so I'll be happy when there's a gold one. <laughs> oh, it's, I'm, I'm sure it's coming. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully. So we, yeah, we launched that YouTube channel and I started, I, I kind of lost time, a bit similar to you with all your, your clients. We kind of, I lost track of my own time. I couldn't, I was, I wanted to help as many people as I possibly can. My, my motto has always been, I want to give more away for free than other people will have you pay for, but you're only limited by how many hours you have in the day. And so yeah. I actually decided to launch an education business called the Affluent Academy, which was training um, other marketers how to sell within their marketing agency and acquire new clients. So we launched that business, which again, was similar to you. We reclaimed that time back because we now had this product and um, we scaled it up. We've now taught thousands of different marketing agencies how to launch, build and scale their ads, but also deliver results. One of our uh, most important metrics is return on investment for our clients. We don't care about the vanity stuff such as likes and comments. We teach people how to get cash return on investment or monetary return on investment for their clients. Um, and yeah, that, that, the rest is history. We launched a new business as of last week called Learn Ads. We're now teaching business owners themselves how to advertise online as well. So we've recognized that there's this very big crisis, especially, well, definitely in the UK. I'm not sure um, what it's like where you are at the moment, but this retail revolution where the companies that aren't innovating, that aren't moving online are going into liquidation are failing right. and those other smaller companies are looking at that happen and realizing they need to advertise and there's not really a lot of ads education out there and so our new business is teaching people how to run ads for themselves and we're doing that for free we're, we really say facebook ads course to do that so wow it's, it's been a very busy time i'm sorry that's that's the long long version of my story <laughs> that is fantastic that's fantastic that is fantastic jordan and i love the fact that you're 26 and you already went through these experiences of having a credit card debt and i loved how you how you know you chose to be vulnerable and as honest as possible and say that you wanted to keep up to that image as a nightclub mm. promoter and that keeping up with the joneses as they say uh, you know, sort of got you into debt. And a lot of yeah. young people need to, needed to learn and hear this. So thank you very much for sharing that. No problem. So now, so now, now that the story part is, is, is done, let's move on to the second part. I, I'm in Vancouver, Canada, but we do a lot of work in India as well. Everywhere in the world, uh, people are scared of Facebook ads. You know what? I don't know. I'm going to lose money. I don't know how to do it. So tell us like a uh, sort of a, you know, the basic, you know, starter point of, uh, you know, you're talking to an entrepreneur mm -hmm. who's otherwise very reasonable and, you know, logical and running a business for the last 10 years. How should one approach Facebook ads? Does he need to understand the demographic, the customer avatar? And, you know, how do you, how do people get into Facebook ads to start with? Yeah, I mean, firstly, as you just, just highlighted, you need to lay with the start with the foundations, you need to understand your buyer persona, your your customer avatar, who is it you're actually trying to sell to. And the easiest way we can do that is just looking at our existing customers. And I think one of the biggest mistakes people make when they first start any kind of digital advertising is they try and sell all of their products or all of their services straight away. And it, it gets really, really messy and really confusing. Whereas we always teach people to start with the lowest hanging fruit. So sell your best selling, your number one statistically best selling product or service to your number one best audience. And so if that means you're excluding 50% of your customers, so be it. You want to focus sure. on the ones or, or the majority. And once you then get return on investment, you're going to get confidence in your ability to advertise. And then you'll be able to replicate whatever strategy you used previously on other products or services and other demographics and audiences. 
Got it. So stick to one product at a time and uh, scale that up. Okay. Exactly. Now my next question is, so when it comes to Facebook ads, should I do text ads, uh, uh, audio ads, video ads? What's the best or should I do all of them? So, so it depends on your product or your service. Um, nine times out of 10, video always performs best. Facebook favor video because if somebody's watching a video on the platform, they're spending more time on the platform. And so generally, sure. videos will be prioritized on the news feed, joint with a really nice bit of ad copy. We always like to um, suggest if you're selling a product, then you show your product in use with some kind of a video. So whether you're a clothing store, it's showing people using the clothes where they are intended to be used, for example, if it's a gym clothing store, for example, or if you are, we, we have a client, which is a bit of a bizarre plot product at the moment, which is a, uh, a UV germ killer for, for mobile phones. And you put your mobile phone in there and it kills all the germs course because of what's going on at the moment and so there's a video of somebody putting that into the into the germ killer pressing the button you see everything in process so somebody knows exactly what it is they're buying so generally we say video is king when it comes to facebook advertising got it so so video now when it comes to actually you know how do you go about so you have a product and so it's a product like a germ killer mobile phone cover jacket hat product that means i'm either manufacturing it or I'm bringing it from a cheaper source and I'm selling it to a more expensive source. And I'm the in-between person. Could be I'm the manufacturer or now I have a decent margin. How do I approach Facebook ads to see if they're going to work for me? Is that a process? For, for if you companies? are... So if you're, if you're a manufacturer trying to find to, to people who are going to white, white label your product, essentially, is that what you mean? No. So if I'm a, if I'm, I could be a manufacturer or I could be a reseller of a product mm -hmm. I've got decent margins and I've never advertised on Facebook. What is the first few things I should do? I make the video uh, of the use case uh, and all of that. But what is it? I mean, do I look at my audience avatar and how do I do the tracking yeah. and all of that? Yeah, so the first thing you want to do is set up a Facebook pixel. You want a Facebook pixel tracking code on there for anyone that doesn't know it very quickly. It's just a small bit of code you insert on your website, which allows us to read the data or read what our customers or potential customers are doing on a website. A lot of people, even if they don't sell e-commerce or don't have e-commerce functionality, think they don't need a pixel. And that's not true. A pixel helps all of your ads optimize. It helps the algorithm know what's working and what isn't working for you. And so every business should have a Facebook pixel set up, even if you're not running ads just to collect data data for future proofing. The second thing you should do is look at the statistics. If you're an existing business with existing sales through other mediums, whether that's organic or through Google ads, just look at statistically what is working for you already. What is selling well and what isn't selling well? And just focus on the things that are statistically doing well. A lot of people think that, okay, when I start advertising, it's a good opportunity for me to start selling a product which I want to start selling because all of our, all businesses have the really high profit margin products and the lower profit margins. And as a business owner, we naturally want to sell a higher profit margin products. But if those aren't our statistically or factually best selling or easiest selling products, we shouldn't start off with that when we are advertising online. Hmm. Interesting. What do you think about upsells? I have a product for $9 and then I have an upsell to $29 and then comes my $500 program. So what do you think about upsells? How should people go about upsells? Yeah, upsell, upsells is dead easy on Facebook. All you need to do is to simply retarget that that pixel traffic that you already have onto your website. It's always good to have some kind of at least at, at a minimum tailor your ads for your upsell so make sure when you're you're writing your ad copy or even in your creative itself you're directly calling out to an existing customer base to make it feel personal and make it feel you're you're just running that ad to that individual person it's not a generalized cold sales ad and also even better than that if you can offer some kind of discount for existing customers or uh, a promotional offer where you're stacking additional products because actually people get used to discounts they don't get used to stacks or or freebies um, and so if you, if you, if there's something extra you can bundle in with your upsells for existing customers that also will help you, uh, convert those customers. So can you run us through various formats of remarketing, remarketing to a customer who's never bought from you versus remarketing to a customer who's bought from you in the past? How would you have two different ads? And yes. What would you see in them? So, so, so what we generally do is we, we have our warm retargeting audience and we have our hot retargeting. Warm retargeting would be essentially retargeting all of our organic places already. So for example, we would retarget people who have engaged with our Instagram or Facebook page or liked any of our posts or signed up to our email list. 
And so, so those are still very warm audiences for us to remarket. And that's what, that's what we'd have as one advert. Then secondary to that, we would have our hot retargeting, which would be people who had added our product to cart or viewed an actual product. So there's more commitment to actually purchase the product that we're looking to remarket. So we always separate them two out. Um, some companies like to separate things even further. If you have an extreme amount of traffic, they like to separate add to carts from page views. But generally speaking, with 99% of the businesses that we work with, we will always put page views and add to carts together and then your organic, such as social media traffic and all of that as a warm audience. Got it. So uh, understood. So these kind of re remarketing. Now, does that mean as a business owner, I need to be comfortable with having my face in front of the video because I need a video ad, then a remarketing ad mm -hmm. for my existing audience, for my cold audience, for my warm audience. There's too much video to be done just for one product. I've mm -hmm. got 10 products. You know what? Forget Facebook advertising. <laughs> yeah, that's a very valid concern. A lot of people have that. And first of all, you do not need your face in front of the camera for, for, for your business. The new business that we're launching, that, that we launched last week, Learn Ads, we made a deliberate, um, de a deliberate fact of not putting our face on camera with video because ultimately we want this business to be something we can potentially sell in 10, 20 years time when we build it to a certain level. And so if a business depends on your face then it's not always as sellable. Right. And so we're opting for things like illustrations, stock imagery. Um, you can even go down the actor route with your videos, but with remarketing, you don't necessarily need to have videos for remarketing. You can get away with images and, and that is, that'll be just as effective for you because you don't need to explain who you are and what you are offering to your customers in remarketing because they already know who you are. So generally, if you do have a product or service which requires some kind of face to camera, and generally that only that only stands if you are a service-based business. Because if you're selling products, there's no reason that you need to be in front of the camera at all. So if you're selling services and you're personally delivering them services, then you only really need to get face to camera on the, the, the cold ads. Got it. So and so, if I'm a, if I want to be, if I deliberately want to become a personal brand, a coach, a guru, then uh, my personal face and all of that makes my personality, the way I talk, my quotes, my dogs coming into my and out of my studio, all of that gives that personal appeal. Definitely, yeah, no, hundred percent. And if you if you are following that kind of a model, when you want to build a, like a build big personal brand around your business, you definitely want to get on front of the camera as much as you can. Got it. Now, when it comes to, can you run us through, I know it's 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 a, it's a hard uh, ask, but can you run us through a step-by-step -step system of from zero to the first 1,000 subscribers? So it's on, on YouTube? Yeah, because I, I, think, I, yeah. I, can't, I, can't, I can't not help, uh, I can't help notice the amazing silver t uh, award that you got from YouTube. So I'm sure a lot of audience members are watching this right now. And they'd love to know what happened with the zero to first. I mean, that's the first. And then I'd like to go from 1,000 to 140,000. Of course. Okay. So the first, the most crucial thing when you're, when you're, you're you want to start building an audience on YouTube and one of the biggest mistakes people make is trying to monetize an audience too soon. You absolutely should never try and monetize an audience when you have, when you have a small audience, because you're just going to wind people up. They're going to see straight through you and they won't think that you are genuine. As I said, I always, I've always strived to give more away for free than other people have you pay for. And so I produce very, very early on and now produce high quality content that other content creators weren't willing to create. And the way I find or found um, video topics to create was through looking at my competitors' comment section. Because a lot of the time, big content creators get caught up in everything that they're doing. And so they stop actually looking at what people on the ground actually want. And so they sure. stop creating the content that they're, their, their audience are actually looking for. So create the content that your competitors are asking for, your competitors' audiences are asking for. Also look through Facebook groups in your in your uh, industry. So if you're in marketing, for example, join as many marketing Facebook groups as possible. Look at the common questions people are asking. What are the what are the topics that they are trying to to learn about? Write them all down and then start making topics around that as well. It really is all in the value you are providing to gain your first couple of thousand subscribers and also making sure you are hot on YouTube SEO as well, which again, doesn't have to be complicated. Just to, to give you a little, a, a quick rundown on that. A, a, one of the big mistakes people make is they try and rank for too many keywords. You should just focus on one keyword or one key phrase. So for example, if I'm trying to rank for Facebook ads and at the moment we, we are the number one 
ranked video for the term Facebook ads and also for, for, for social media marketing as well on YouTube. And the reason why is because we only focus our SEO on that one keyword. So we released a new video on Facebook ads recently. We have Facebook ads in the description in a very detailed keyword rich description at least four to five times. We have Facebook ads in the title. We have Facebook ads in the video name itself. And then in the tags, they're all Facebook ads related tags. So we're not trying to relate to rank for Facebook ads and digital marketing and how to run ads. We're not trying to spread ourselves too thin. We're just focusing on one thing and then the YouTube algorithm rewards you for that. And of course, then if you're ranked, that's how you're naturally going to get organic subscribers who are finding you through your video content. Got it. Any specific strategy to come into the suggested video category? It, it just purely the only way that works, and and, and it, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a gray area of how the algorithm actually figures that out. But from my understanding, it's through the amount of watch time and click throughs that you're getting on your channel. So if you've got good thumbnails on your channel, which are getting straight to the point, and you've got text on there so people know exactly what it is. So if you've got a good, good click through rate, that's, and of course your titles as well, again, getting straight to the point, try not to click bait your audience because I think people get annoyed with that. Um, but also just having a very SEO rich video and description really helps you because you're gonna get more people finding that video. And then again, the quality of the content is gonna make people watch it for longer. You're gonna have a higher retention time. And then again, YouTube will reward you for that because they see you're keeping people on the platform. Awesome. So does what's the difference between doing that in, in your initial days and then doing it all the way to the 140,000? Was there a shift in strategy? Did you bring in other guests? Did you talk about you know some some uh, controversial topics? I mean, what, like people talk about all kinds of things. Did you have to talk about Trump to get more views today? <laughs> So, so I've, I've, I've never I've never made particularly controversial content. And I only just recently started interviewing other content creators on my channel. And we've had some pretty big content creators. We've had some pretty big people. Never we've had Nathan Chan, the, the, the owner of Founder. We've had Neil Patel. And to be honest, I've seen that had zero impact on my subscriber count whatsoever. Absolutely zero. And so I think that it depending on, unless you're getting someone and you're interviewing someone who is literally trending at that moment in time. So lots of people are searching for them. Yeah. It's, I, I don't think it hasn't, a, a monumental impact. The from from zero to one hundred and twenty thousand, I hadn't interviewed a single person on my channel apart from my customers, and so I, I think the key. There's a couple of things. Always being consistent with your content. We we always produce two pieces of content every week, and again, making sure that your content's always valuable. And also ads, pre-roll ads really do help as well. So we, we even from our first 500 subscribers, we started running pre-roll adverts and not an advert where we're selling anything at all. A simple advert just saying, hey, I'm Jordan. This is what I do. This is my story. Come over to my channel and subscribe to me and hopefully, hopefully you enjoy my content. So you're not asking for anything in return for people to. So you're essentially paying to build your subscriber account, reaching out to your, your the demographic that you're trying to target on your channel. But pre-roll adverts definitely help. Although we haven't actually had any of them running for say around 50,000 subscribers now, but it's definitely what got us off the ground. And then you get that snowball effect. You get that, you, you've got that social proof then. People think you are a somebody because you have a certain amount of subscribers as, as strange as that may be. But then when they look at your channel, they're much more likely statistically to subscribe to you because other people have done before you, before them. Sure. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I'm so happy you brought it up because that just shows an entrepreneurial mindset to be able to invest in pre-roll ads because this is your platform where you have your content to leave everything to organic. I have never understood that. I've always said, I mean, 20 years back, we had to know somebody in TV to say, can you get me a spot for me to get mm -hmm. known? And today, all you need to do is spend some money on on YouTube ads to get known. And even then, if you're looking at organic to work, then we're setting ourselves up for failure. So I love yeah. the uh, you know the investment in your own channel strategy. Yeah. Now my, my next question is when it comes to uh, you know when it comes to uh, your uh, building a studio. Like I love your studio. It's minimalistic. It's amazing. I love your voice. You know, mm -hmm. it's uh, you're a good looking guy. That helps. But uh, you. you're wearing black and there's white and there's a whole black and wheat white theme. Is that a deliberate, well thought of strategy? Yeah. So, so I mean, to be, to be completely honest with you, it's, it's, it's kind of just lucky that things look good right now because this isn't actually a studio. It's just it's just 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 my office and we've got another desk there as well. 
Um, but I like to keep it, it's the same with all of our companies, I like to keep a very minimalist brand. I've always been inspired by, by Apple and the way they've done their marketing and their design. And so throughout all of our companies, we have a very minimalist, minimalist black, white, and an accent color. So that accent color changes for each of our companies. I'm, uh, I've, I've never had a lot of colors, but that being said, multiple colors in certain, certain brands work really, really well. But with me personally, I like to keep things as minimalist and simplistic as I possibly can. Okay, so when it so when it comes to setting up the mic and the camera and everything, and you have a nice light on your face, and it's coming from two angles, maybe so there's no shadow and all of that. Mm -hmm. So uh, does that matter when you're starting off, or to start off with a good-looking channel so everybody wants to stay tuned, or does it matter? My first content was recorded on my phone, on my on my selfie camera, um, and it, it probably wasn't until I I hit maybe the five thousand subscriber mark. Um, and that was only three years ago. And I wouldn't even say things have really changed an awful lot since then. And so, but even still, you can get yourself a relatively inexpensive, inexpensive camera. My, my camera for my YouTube channel cost 600 pounds. And I had that up until three weeks ago when I bought a new camera. And so I don't think, I think as long as you're, you're mindful of making sure you haven't got really low quality content, as long as you're uploading in 1080p HD, then you're absolutely fine. Light boxes, for example, this one, this is still only a 60 pound, there's a pair of them 60 pounds on Amazon. So you don't need a lot of expensive equipment. This this mic is, is 100 pounds on Amazon. So I, I think uh, some people put a heavy focus in making sure they invest a lot into their setup. But I think ultimately, all it boils down to is the quality of your content. Got it. Quality of the content, which means answers to relevant contextual questions that people are searching for youtube being a search engine people are asking for answers to immediate problems mm -hmm. and if you're answering those immediate questions in a fun entertaining easy step-by-step bite-size easy to digest uh, mm -hmm. format that is the definition of value is that correct absolutely couldn't agree more okay awesome so uh, jordan tell us uh, tell us a little bit about your, uh, I want to know a little bit about all your businesses, because if people who are listening to this want to reach out to you, get your help. So we'll mm. go backwards. We'll learn, we'll start with the latest baby in the house. We'll go with learn ads. Yeah. So how can entrepreneurs listening to this interview get into learn ads? Is there a website and tell us about that business? Yeah. So our website is learnads.io. We strive to be the biggest uh, digital marketing advertising training program in uh, training business in the world. We, we currently teach Facebook and um, Facebook adverts. We have a free course and a pro course, and uh, we are going to be releasing a series of other platforms throughout this year: Google, YouTube, LinkedIn, Snapchat, TikTok. So we want to be number one go-to platform for teaching people how to advertise online because we know how to do this ourselves through our marketing agency. We literally teach the exact strategies that we use in our marketing agency for our clients. We hold nothing back whatsoever because we recognize that digital marketing is something which is very intimidating for business owners. It's right. something they're very scared of. And so we want to break it down in a very simple way for people to understand. And so they can learn completely for free with our free training, the A to Z of how to launch their first Facebook ads, find their audience, write ad creative and create good content as well for their for their their platforms. So yeah, that's, that's learn ads. It's targeted to business owners who want to learn how to advertise online. Awesome. And tell us about your agency. How does that help? Yeah. So the digital marketing agency and the affluent agency, we work with e-commerce brands. We do work with a few, uh, a few other different industries as well. If we, if, if it takes a fancy, but we focus on e-commerce, we specialize in Facebook adverts again and sales funnels. We do a bit of content creation as well. And yeah, we, we, we work with businesses who don't have the time to run ads themselves and who want an expert to do it for them. We're a very small team, which means we provide a very bespoke service. And yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much it with, with the agency. And okay. that's affluent.co forward slash agency if anyone's interested. Got it. And I'm going to put all the links over uh, in the description. So tell us that when it comes to, now let's speak to agency owners. Now agency owners, and you help agency owners, you know, start and scale their agencies mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. So agency owners always like, how do I get my next client? And I have two clients coming in, one leaving. I never, you know, I'm always there. I'm, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm always trying to stay keep my head above the ground, mm -hmm. how would you respond to that? Well, the most important thing, I, I, one of the, the most important things that one of my sales mentors taught me when I was, when I first jumped into sales, when I had that issue myself, I put all my eggs in one basket, a really big potential client, and it fell through at the last moment and I had nothing left. 
to fall back on. And it, it felt really, really bad. And he said to me, Jordan, your biggest problem is you haven't kept your, your pipeline full and you always need to keep your pipeline full. And so no matter how many clients you've got, it doesn't matter whether you're a 100K a month agency, you should always have other clients in the pipeline, always be have some kind of sales metric, have some kind of way to keep people interested or keep clients on the back burner, slow burning clients who you're just maintaining a relationship who said no to you a couple of months ago, or even just doing a bit of cold outreach. So keep your pipeline. If you keep your pipeline full, you will not have the issue where if you lose a client, you won't have anything to back that up. You always need to keep that sales mechanism in place. I love, I love what you said of a, uh, keep that slow burning relationship with somebody who said no to you in the past. Mm. So there is no, there's no place for, uh, ego in business. Somebody said no to you. Don't take it to heart. No, uh, they probably don't mean it. Their no was maybe not yet. And uh, so, so, so tell us how. So, do you keep clients on the on the slow burner? And they said no to you, and you're like, I'm going to ignore your no because it's no for now. It's not mm -hmm. yet, and I'm going to come back. How do you approach these and ha have some of them come back? So, so yes, yeah, absolutely. We've we've had that before. We've had it many times when when a client said no to us on a certain price, and then when they've reached out again, our prices have increased. And so you always get a little bit of self satisfaction from that, but you should never, you should never burn a bridge in, in any, in, in any kind of business. And so we like to email people. We have people on a specific list on our CRM system and we like to email, send an email out to people individually um, every month or so just to literally check in and say, Hey, look, how's things going in the business? Not even asking for a pitch, not asking for a call. We just say, Hey, how are you getting on um, the house? Such as something relevant to them. We always make sure we put something relevant in any outreach that we do because Nobody likes feeling like a number or like they're yeah. on the receiving end of an email blast. 100%. And that strategy has helped to you get clients back. Definitely. Yeah, no, it really has. Okay. So for again, for agency owners who are watching this, what else should they do? They just started, they've got their first two, three clients. Uh, you said always build a pipeline. So what do I do? I run Facebook ads and keep always keep three hours a day to be on calls. What would be your strategy to always yeah. keep the pipeline full? I've just got three people in my company and uh, I've just started and you know, I'm bootstrapped. What should I do? Yeah, I mean, if you've got existing clients, existing testimonials, Facebook ads can be a good option for you. Um, but a lot of agency owners underestimate how much money you'll spend to get leads on Facebook. And so they give up very early. I mean, as an agency owner, it's a very high ticket service, especially if you're charging above $1,000 a month, for example. And if you are doing that, you need to be prepared to spend at least five or 50 to $100 per lead in some cases, depending on who you're reaching out to. But to be honest, we like to fall back on cold sales and we always follow a multi-platform strategy not personally anymore so it's a bit hypocritical as a new start agency we would but now we don't we get a lot of referrals and we have a lot of organic streams because of the social media and the, and the personal brand but as a new start agency cold sales is at the forefront of everything that we did okay we would cold call we would dm we would email and we always follow a multi-platform strategy we hit people from absolutely all angles because if you had five friends and you needed to contact all of those five friends you wouldn't just whatsapp all of them because you know one of them might be on Instagram, one of them might answer the phone, one of them never answers the phone. And so in sales, the biggest mistake we make is choosing one sales mechanism, choosing just cold calling or choosing emails, and just presuming that every single person you reach out to is going to respond to that platform in the same way. And so when we outreach, we always like to hit people in a in, on, on multiple platforms. So we may cold call them on a Monday. We might send them a DM on the Tuesday. We might send them an email on the Wednesday. We're hitting them from all angles, just dependent on what platform they will respond best to. So is it a good idea? Like, for example, if I say this is a lot of hard work, what you just said, it's mm -hmm. a lot of hard work. It's a lot of personalization mm -hmm. and it cannot be cold. It has to be warm from the heart for you. I need to say, yep. you know what? Yep. I, lo I loved your uh, interview with uh, with Avi and I saw that you got the new $600 camera. I sell the flash that goes on top of the camera. Can I have a five minute conversation and tell you how my flash can help you with your camera? So it has to be contextual. Mm -hmm. So that that requires time, understanding, empathy, patience, all of that. So does that mean I should have a separate business development person to do all of this? Or, to, start, uh, to start off with, as, as an agency owner, I mean, I, for, for me, I was a one man band until I until we were we hit six figures in the agency. I was a one man band until we hit hit, hit around nine, eight or nine clients. And so so we well, we outsource a few small jobs, but but as far as the majority of service delivery and sales was concerned it was just me and so i think as an agency owner you can you can easily get yourself started and scale up to a reasonable level on your own while still maintaining relationships with clients while still delivering service and still doing sales outreach absolutely when you hit that point when you're feeling that pinch 
there is the need for somebody like a sales manager or someone in business development um, to, to actually be selling on behalf of you. Like for now, I, I certainly couldn't be doing direct sales in the agency anymore. Got it. Uh, I'd like to shift gears and go back to, you know, we are all somewhere a byproduct of what our family is. Can you mm -hmm. talk to us a little bit about your family? Your parents have must be proud. You've got your yeah. own channel, your own brand, and you talk, you're saying I have multiple businesses. Mm -hmm. And uh, how has been the trend? How's that, how's that been from a nightclub owner who's coming back at 5 a.m. in the morning and ra raking up credit card debt to now somebody who's teaching other entrepreneurs mm -hmm. on how they should run their multi-million dollar businesses? Mm -hmm. How do your parents feel about that? Yeah, my, my, my parents my parents are very proud. We we I've, I've always... We we grew up in a in a in a small village in in the countryside in the UK in 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 a, in a, in a um, county called Norfolk and I've always had everything I've needed but not everything I've wanted. I'm always I'm, I'm very open to, to very always very um, sure to admit that I've always had everything I've, I've needed but not everything I've wanted. I never got pocket money and so my dad left me with this desire for working and so I started my first job when I was like. 14, 14 years old as a paper round getting paid 15 pounds a week to literally go around the entire village and spend an hour every single day delivering the local paper and so my dad always instilled that in me and I think I was always very aware that my dad did relatively well for himself but 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 not enough for him to be perfectly satisfied with, with where he was at with everything in his life and so I'm very thankful that he didn't give me everything that I wanted because that really instilled that entrepreneur entrepreneurial mindset within me and so for him when when everything started going well I think at the start it was a little bit of disbelief it's always it's always I can imagine a bit strange when your son starts doing very well and 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 and, and, and surpasses the, the level that you're doing I think that must be a very hard thing to process and uh, my mum's always been my number one cheerleader, full stop. My mum's just, she's just like, you go, you, you take over the world. You do anything you want to do, you right. can achieve it. Um, but we have a really great relationship, me, me, me and both my parents. We, we, we get on really, really well, and, and, and they're incredibly proud of what I've achieved. And they also support every move that I make. At the start, they were very cautious, though. Try to tried to talk me out of quitting the job, try to talk me out of quitting university. In fact, my dad didn't know I quit uni or got kicked out of university until he saw it on my YouTube channel. Oh, I really yeah. <laughs> he, he wasn't best pleased. So he is a subscriber. He is a subscriber. Yeah, absolutely. He's, he comments on every video. Oh, how sweet. That I love that. I love that. You know, I speak to my parents every day as well. My parents are in their 70s. They're hardworking entrepreneurs. They work day in and day out. And that's what my dad, my first conversation with my mom is, Are you? have you eaten well? I'm 44 years old. My first conversation with my dad is, are your customers happy with you? <laughs> so, so you know we 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 an app an apple will never fall far from the tree whatever we yeah. want yeah. eventually it's it's uh you know it's you know a family and parents and i always say one thing in my you know i wrote a book many years ago and it said uh, stay close to the router uh mm -hmm. and which means we're all devices and our parents are routers and sometimes we don't get along with them. Sometimes our parents, especially our dads, mm -hmm. will show us the mirror in the most rude way possible. And we're like, how mm -hmm. you can't talk to me like that. You can't tell me I'm, I can't do this. I'll do exactly <laughs> this because you told me not to do it. Now, yeah. when I say stay close to the router, I'm saying just a device staying close to the router gets more internet bars and it's able to download more information about on itself. So... Mm -hmm. If I stay close to, I mean, I don't need to stay in the same house or whatever. I just need to stay connected to the family so that, and just listen to everyone instead of going out there and listening to gurus who have no idea about who I am. My dad mm. tells me, you know what? You are more, you're, 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 you're more uh, sort of geared to succeed at speaking on stage rather than running Facebook ads because yeah. the nitty gritty and the operational things, you know, that, and so to that, most young kids would say, you think telling me there's something I can't do. So I'm going to prove you wrong. And I want to talk to you again and all of that. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, and then we go out into the world and look at mentors and we say, you know what, what should I do? And a mentor has no knowledge about who you are and where you're coming from. And so therefore we get mixed up. So I always say, stay close to the router, listen to the harsh, uh, maybe sometimes harsh knowledge that's coming from your family, because they're telling you. They're telling you what they can and why not use them as mentors. So I'm, I'm very happy. I, I love the fact that your dad comments on every video. That I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm it's, it's, it's very, sometimes I delete them though. They're embarrassing ones. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's very, um, it's, it's very interesting that you just said that because I, 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 I don't have many conversations with people who aren't, um, who aren't huge, huge, huge advocates of 
always getting a mentor, always following advice on mentor, because I'm actually not one of those people myself. People say to me many times on podcasts, Jordan, who have been your mentors? And, and I can't actually name all big marketing gurus or big internet sensations that have been my mentors because there haven't been any. My biggest mentors have been my closest friends and my family. I've learned from the people who are very, very close to me. I've got friends who are on a very similar trajectory as me, uh, trajectory as me in business. And so I've followed in their footsteps, learned from mistakes together. And all of my mentorship has been close to the router, as you say. That is fantastic. That is just fa because, you know, it's just it's just how it works. So, Jordan, tell mm -hmm. us what what do the next five years look for you? And uh, like a couple of new books coming out and, you know, you and Richard Branson hanging out together jamming <laughs> in the or, 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 sky, or skydiving with Gary Vee. What's what's new on the plate? So, um, so, 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 well, I'd, I'd like to, I'd like to, I have a book called The 50 Minute Agency, which, which does need updating at some point. The beauty of marketing is it's always changing, leaving us updated, uh, outdated rather. Um, so just continue building the brand, building a bigger impact. Um, learn ads, we're really going to, I see learn ads as being a business which will, which will filter through and grow all of the other businesses because we're now catering to all business owners and therefore they're going to be business owners who require marketing services, who will filter down to the agency. They're going to be some business owners who may even be interested in a marketing agency who will filter down to our academy. And so I want to continue building an impact, do a little bit more public speaking when we're allowed to again, um, and yeah, just further build the brand, further build the team. We're hiring a new sales team member this month, as well as a new content creator, which is exciting. And just yeah, continue on the same path and enjoy the ride along the way. That's fantastic. You know, Jordan, one thing I've, you know, I'm, I'm also building a parallel brand on, uh, I'm going to start a parallel brand, this internet moguls. And one suggestion I had for you, which I learned over time was, I'm like, I want to grow fast and everybody wants to grow fast, still be efficient, still be value. So I realized vernacular, if I go, if English is the language that I'm comfortable with, but I can interview or outsource to people who will take the same interview and put it in Spanish or Portuguese or other mm -hmm. languages, and then put it back on my channel, the reach explodes and I can now go to multiple countries. And I've seen a lot of channels with, uh, with, with no personal brand, but just because they're reaching out to maybe, uh, you know, uh, even in China, there's uh, Cantonese, Mandarin, and you know, all of these. So people mm. are narrowing down on those niches and saying, so I was thinking, okay, like an entrepreneur, why, how can we automate this system? Why not I do an interview with Jordan and I send it to the editing team. And when they're editing it, I send it to another person who can edit with, uh, you know, Spanish sub subtitles mm. and in between. And then maybe we can do a little bit in Hindi or we can do something mm. in Bengali and all of this is possible with Fiverr.com and all of that. And, you know, it, it is a bit of a logistical, uh, but like everything else. But then why not have, you know, appeal to multiple audiences? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I, I've, I've had people suggest that multiple times, with like the info products um, and, and things like that before. And it's definitely something that, I mean, if you do find a tool which makes that, that process easier, then, then certainly let me know about that. Or that's will, an opportunity to... Very soon, in the next two to three weeks, I'll send you an email and I'll tell you how I've been able to find the right people in the right places. Because I, I spoke to somebody recently in Brazil and that person is... Uh, no, actually, sorry, let me rewind that. Uh, I heard a very famous marketer say that he converted his video ads into Spanish and ran ads in Brazil because the ROAS for his product in, in, you know, there was, you know, much better. And so mm -hmm. just by, he, he said, a lot of people would add, add, would say, oh my God, it's too much work, forget it. But this guy saw profit and he went to Brazil and he said, Oof. since then, yeah, I found my, I found my gold over there. So, yeah. yeah. That's amazing. What's the English language, which is saturated with, 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 with lots of, with lots of ads and, and it's other industry. It, lots of people always talk to me, marketing agencies always say to me from other countries, say, Jordan, should I speak my native language or should I be reaching out to English speaking businesses? I always say, if you can speak another language, you should reach out to businesses in that language because that's going to be your competitive edge. There's loads of people from the UK and from the US and from other English speaking countries competing over English speaking businesses. But if you can, you can speak your native tongue, then you've got a competitive edge over other people. Awesome. Now, this brings me to my last question, uh, Jordan. Uh, you know, we say the definition of an internet mogul, which is the name of our company, our show and everything. An internet mogul is somebody who is able to run a successful business at the same time, 
have the power to manage their own time and do everything else in life which gives them happiness mm-hmm. you know because the internet allows you to do more from mm-hmm. any remote location mm-hmm. but at the same time at the end of this interview put my laptop off and go back and spend time with my kids so that according to me is the definition of an internet mogul what would be your definition of an internet mogul an internet mogul it's it's it's, it's some it, it's somebody an internet mogul it, it's somebody that strives to impact as many people as they can online because right. i think that that if your business has builds positive impact on other people and you you're not using money as your pursuit and it's impacting positively impacting other people then that the finances will will follow you when i stopped chasing money and started chasing impacts everything changed lovely and you're all of 26 i love the way you talk that is just fantastic <laughs> Thanks, tell me man. jordan what's the best channel for people who are watching this right now to follow you at so youtube would be the one to so youtube jordan plasson or instagram as well jordan plasson perfect jordan it's been a pleasure talking to you thank you very much for your time and uh, once again this is avi arya father of two girls six dogs husband to a superwoman a street car racer turned hotelier now social media marketer and founder of internet moguls signing off with you.